Good morning, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of What's Hot with Sea of Tranquility. Joining me here today, once again, my fellow Sea of Tranquility-er, however we want to say that, Stephen Reed from Scotland. Greetings, my friend. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing all right. Doing all right. We've got, uh, Stephen's got some new releases to talk about. So uh, we're going to try and make this a regular thing and uh, have Stephen, who is one of my most trusted uh, writers on the Sea of Tranquility staff on the website. And he reviews quite a bit of product for us, along with John Newdorf. Uh, I'm going to have both of these guys on the show going forward. So Stephen's got some cool new releases he wants you guys to be uh, aware of, and he's going to talk a little bit about them. So I'm going to turn it over to him so he can introduce and talk about some great new CDs that have been coming out fairly Thank recently. Some right. more recent than others, right? But yeah, some, some more recent than others. Um, because of the way that, 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 that you and I run, is some of the stuff I get is, has been out for a little while, and then I have to take my time to listen to it. This is an album by a band called M. Opus, an Irish band called Origins. You have to take some time to listen to this. This is, was released last year, so this is a 2019 release. This is a double album. There's a lot of songs. But both discs are just about full. This is a concept album, okay? So, and I've written a little bit down here because I had to go actually go onto their website and read the lyrics along with this. So if you're a little bit frightened by a concept album, if you don't like an album where you've got a little bit of spoken word, this is almost like a radio play to music. That, that ticks boxes for me. I love that sort of thing. If that's not your thing, I'll be honest, I'm starting with one that's not for you, okay? And there's no way of dressing that up. But the kind of evocative artwork tells you a little bit about what's going on, but not really. So we're 150 years in the future, okay? And think about Star Trek. So you could be beamed up. This is happening. Beam me up, Scotty. Absolutely, okay? <laughs> so it's real and it's happening, but it's not happening very well, okay? And one of the first guys who invents this technology is lost and transmit somewhere. And it turns into a kind of whodunit, mystery, murder, is it, was it, we're not sure. But it's set to some of the best prog music, prog music that I've listened to in a long time. Now, this band of previous, this is 1975 Triptych. Okay, this is their debut album. This is our second album. Now, it's called 1975 Triptych because they're pretending if it was released in 1975. Okay, it's got that vibe, it's got that feel. This is their 1975 album. I can't remember what year, but they're claiming this one was released a little bit later. So you're kind of getting a vibe of what they're about. Okay, so you've got Jonathan Casey. He's the singer and voice actor, and it says that on here. So that gives you an idea of just how deep we're going in, in, into the, the kind of play side of things. And his character is Miller McKee. He's the main character. And I have to take my hat off to the guy because he's a singer in a band, but I could happily believe he was an actor too because it's not just him talking a story, he's playing a part. And there's a section in it where Miller McKay likes, uh, Miller McKee, excuse me, likes a drink. And he does that very well. That's one of those things that can trip people up, you know. And it's, it's done tremendously well. But you've got everything on here from, to me, there's lots of traditional prog on here. So, yeah, you can nod to Genesis. You can, you know, nod to Yes. You can bring a little bit of Hogarth era Marillion in here. It's got that kind of floating atmosphere. But there's a bit of Bowie in here. There are some sing-along choruses and all wrapped up in a remarkable concept story that if you want to take the time, it's a great journey, one for a journey in the car, this album. I found it. You know, I had a, a night where I had a journey, a long journey there and a long journey back, disc one there, disc two on the way home. And I felt like I'd been part of a story all the way through, very atmospheric. And, and it comes highly recommended. And the standard musicianship on it, fantastic. Well, Both I think we have a lot of a lot of viewers who really enjoy concept albums. So I think yeah. that'll be something definitely to look out for. Th this, is, this is excellent, I have to say. As I say it's the, the standard of the voice acting on this album is what kind of really knocked me a little bit because it's so good. Do you know what kind of knocked me over? It's so good. A lot of bands can put out an album where the, the, the kind of story and play side is fantastic. The music's a bit mm, an afterthought. And a lot of bands do it the other way around. The music's brilliant, but the story is like, do you know, so old. We've all heard it before. This text both boxes, really good. M Opus, really good band. As I say, cool. all the two albums so far, keep your eye out for them. So M Opus Origins, very cool. Yes, it is. 
Okay. And go and make sure you go and read Stephen's full review on our website too at www.seeatranquility.org. It's a good one. And another one that I've reviewed over there is Pure Reason Revolution. Yeah. Okay. Now this album is called, I believe, Upnia. I'll apologize to anyone that can pronounce that better than I can. Now, upnia means to breathe. It's normal breathing. It's the breathing that you're doing right now. You don't notice it. That's what upnia is. And that, I think, is trying to convey the naturalness. But then when you see the album art here that we've got, you also begin to understand the kind of unnaturalness of, of Pure Reason Revolution. So this is a band that released three albums with an EP and then split in 2011. And those three albums, the early albums, took you on a really wide journey. Their debut was very Pink Floyd. It was kind of derided because it was the guitar sound is so David Gilmer, but man, did they do it well. And then the next two albums, Hammer and Anvil, it, it took you down a kind of an electro prog route and they took you somewhere that you just didn't anticipate at all. It was completely different and still sounded like them. And that's what this album does too. It's different again. It's quite raw. They've been quite brave with the production on this album. Some of the the vocals, I think, are very honest. Um, it, it's just, it's the sort of album that it isn't over polished, but it's still beautiful. Um, and I think that's quite a rare trait to be able to pull out. I mean, it's a, it's a proper prog album. There's, there's lots, lots of music, not a lot of songs. But they're not epics, they're, they're not stretching out beyond what they want to do. They're a duo, so it's uh, John Courtney, Chloe Alper, they're the, kind of, the, the main two in the band. Other people come in and out and help, and, and they were more of a band previously. But they both sing, so you get lots of kind of harmonies. They're both capable in their own right. This is them here. I got a nice signed card with this one from this Bumbling Shed that I got this one from. So a nice little sort of exclusive that came with that. There were one of those bands that when they came back or when they announced they were going to come back, I was a bit frightened. I really like the, the three albums in the EP that, that they released before and I thought, it can't be that good. A break of that length of time, always a bit frightening. But they've absolutely knocked it out of the park. I am really excited and I hope that it's not a one-off. I hope that they're, that they're going to stick together um, because they, they to me were a loss. I saw them live once on, on the tour that they announced they had announced previously to the tour that they were going to finish, um, and they were just outstanding. It was just incredible. That's as I say, it's one of those albums that I think you need to get into. You need to learn to to understand its message more than anything else. It's not going to, you know, tell you everything that's got to tell you in its first couple of listens. I think you need to listen. The first time I actually put it on, I was completely underwhelmed. And I kind of put it to the side and I came back to it and thought, yeah, okay, there's, there's more here than I thought. And after three or four or five or six lessons, it's become really standard rotation in, in, in my listening, I have to say. Highly recommended. That is uh, Pure Reason Revolution. And the album is called Upnia. Okay. The opposite of apnea, I guess. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, I never thought of that. There you go. I never thought of that. So from there... I've got one, and I don't have a picture of this one now. I've reviewed this one for Fireworks Magazine, who are also right here in the UK. Um, and this is Burning Witches, okay? And it's Dance with the Devil, right? So this is a complete about turn from the two before. We've, got, we've had a prog epic. We've had a kind of raw, modernist prog album. Burning Witches land somewhere between Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, King Diamond, uh, and Merciful Fate, which is kind of one in the same and not. Um, it's an all-girl outfit. This is their third album. They've got a brand new singer, uh, Laura Gildemund. So we get lots of things. I'm giving myself lots of difficult stuff to pronounce tonight. There you go. <laughs> um, and she came in two weeks before the band played Sweden Rock. Their previous singer, Serena Telly, decided she wanted to do something different. Kind of dropped them in it a little bit. They've been very kind about that, it has to be said. Um, but they, she kind of dropped them in it. They had two weeks. They brought her in. Now, she has sang with Shadow Rise before. So they're a kind of progressive death metal tinge sort of thing, or extreme more than death, maybe. Um, but she was a clean vocalist, very clean vocalist in that outfit. And she sang in one of Arjun Lucasson's 
Squires, who does Star One and, and Aerial and yeah, all these yeah, projects. Yeah. And, and he doesn't muck about, he doesn't bring in anyone that's not good. But I did wonder how hard that voice would fit with the kind of metal that we're talking about here. Very traditional, but very in your face. But man, has she turned it on. It is absolutely fantastic. She's found a grittiness and she calls it distortion, which kind of gives the impression that she's growling. There's no growling. She's a singer. And they, they just really hit it for me that it's, it's bright and it's not nasty, but it doesn't, it's not taking any prisoners. It's straight for the throat. I mean, there's a bit of silliness that there's fantasy lyrics there, Burning Witches, and most of her songs are based around witches. They try and modernise it up a little bit and, and kind of show how that is relevant to them in their modern life. And they do a little bit of that quite well. I think they could maybe do with kind of moving on from that a little bit. It's a bit of a, you know, shtick that they don't necessarily need. They're too good for it, to <laughs> yeah. be honest with you. Um, but they're one of the few bands that are kind of doing that style that I've come through that are, that are new, that really hit it for me. Uh, and it's, you know, thankfully there's an awful lot more women in rock and metal, but I try and steer away from that with them. There's, there's no need to mention that they're just a great heavy metal band that, that are doing it well. And so that, a lot of people are talking about them these days. Yeah, well, they're on Nuclear Blast as well, so they're obviously yeah, which, they're a good push from them, that has to be said. They're on a good label for this sort of thing. And they are playing uh, Sweden Rock. They were meant to be going out with Ross the Boss from, well, X of Manowar. Right. That obviously has been cancelled, but it's been moved back to the end of the year, so they're hopeful that that's still going to happen, European dates. And then they've been announced for Sabaton Fest or Sabaton, whatever their festival is, um, for next year. They were meant to be on this year. It's been moved to next year. And I must admit, I've gone and checked them out on YouTube. I was intrigued to see how someone that had only been with a band for two weeks and had to learn a set without... She, uh, Laura lives in Switzerland. Sorry, she lives in Holland. So she's from the Netherlands. The band are from Switzerland. So there's three live in Switzerland. There's two live in the Netherlands. And they don't always get together very often. So they come together the day before a gig. And then they kind of practice like mad. And then they go and hit the stage. And I thought, well, how did how does Sweden Rock go? Man, is it good? Do you know? Yeah. And I'm really impressed. And, and I think, obviously, maybe to make it a bit easier for her, they also did uh, a cover of Holy Diver, the Dio classic. And it's just really on the money. But she doesn't try and eat Ronnie James Dio because nobody can. No, no. But she doesn't fall into that trap. So, yeah, they, they, they're really good. That's her third album, Dance With The Devil. Hex and Hammer, which is with the previous singer, that's also worth checking out too. And their self-titled debut was what actually got them their deal. So all three albums, very good. I'm probably going with Dance with the Devil. That to me is maybe the, the strongest thing. Favourite of the three, yeah. Okay. Yep, absolutely. Burning Witches. Yep. So from there, I'm going back to something that was released a little bit earlier last year. Okay, and this is a well-known name. This is Biff Byford. Okay, so this is School of Hard Knocks, and this is after all these years, Saxon, lead singer. So obviously they've been on the go since their self-titled debut back in, oh, where are we now? I'm going to get this wrong, 76 and about there. So somebody, will, I'm sure somebody will correct me, but we're in about that <laughs> sort of time. And amazingly, after all this time, he's decided to go and do a solo album. So I, I must admit, I thought, well, what's that all about? Do you know, why would you decide at this stage when he's, do you know, arguably the face of Saxon, and considering how busy Saxon have been in recent years, right? Yeah, and, and how successful again. I mean, the, the, the first time I saw Saxon, which well, I'm not even considered guessing what album it was on, but it's not all that long ago. It was probably within the last 15 years. They played in a venue called King Tut's Wawa Hut in Glasgow. And you can tell, yeah, there you go. You can tell from, I mean, a lot of people just call it King Tut's, but let's see King Tut's Wawa Hut. And you can tell from, from that that it's not big. Do you know, it's a very small room. They sell enough tickets that if it sells out and you don't get in early, you're around the corner, you can't see the stage. So it's that sort of venue. And it was like, you know, why are this band playing this size of venue? And they've gone in that space of time to playing, unfortunately, it was burnt down in, in recent times uh, with uh, the, the School of Arts in Glasgow. It's, it was the building that backed onto that. There was a massive fire that ruined both. So the ABC in Glasgow and they headlined the main hall in there. And that's not massive. But we've gone from a venue that was, we're talking a few hundred to a venue that was a few thousand. And it just shows you how a band of that time can come back. But I did wonder, what was he going to do? And the answer to that is he's kind of, there are some songs on here that are 
to know we've got Welcome to the Show, School of Hard Knocks itself. And they're what I call old Saxon. Because to me, the early Saxon stuff, they're a hard rock heavy metal band. I know that they're new wave of British heavy metal. But realistically, uh, with modern eyes, it's hard rock. Do you know, metal's a different thing now. And, and, and I would think Sa Saxon's music that they've been putting out the last 20 years or so, to me anyway, is much heavier than their early how, stuff. Even yeah, though their early like, stuff at the time was considered very heavy. That yeah. just goes to show you how metal has kind of changed a bit over the years. Yeah, it's interesting because now I would say that they're almost a European power metal band. Right. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, they kind of fall into that. It's galloping drums and, you know, big thick riffs. And, and they, they are really good at it. They're, a, they're a, a band who are still consistent after all these years. But the early stuff, it's where a lot of the fans' hearts lie. And there's some stuff on here that's like that, but there's only some stuff on here that's like that. Now, he's got a great guest list on this. So we've got Phil Campbell from Motorhead is on here. You've got Alex Holsworth. He's been with uh, Leona Rhapsody. Yep. You've got Dave Kemp, who's in a band called Waver Sons that I like a lot. That's Toby Jepsen that was in Little Angels. That's his band now. You've got Nibs Carter from Saxon on here. And you've got uh, Frederick Ackerson from Ope. So oh, yeah. Big guests. And some of these guys are, are on, on most of this. You've also got stuff like The Pit and the Pendulum. Uh, you've got Worlds Collide. And I would go as far as to say they're more modern metal. So it's not quite what Saxon's doing now. It's definitely not the early stuff. It's just got a little bit more aggression and a little bit more bite to it than, than what they're doing. But it's not, we're not extreme metal. We're not talking that. But it does it well and it shows what a great singer Biff Byford is. And he's had some health issues in recent times. But you can hear that he's come through that, you know, thankfully. And there's a couple of covers on here. So you've got Throw Down the Sword. So that's, that's a Wishbone Ash classic. Great song. And he does it really, really well. There's a lot of respect there. It's got the, the pacing is right. It's got that feel. But he's not just copying it. It's really good. And then there's one that gets a lot of love. The Scarborough Affair. Okay, so we're looking at Simon and Garfunkel here. And uh, I must admit, I don't think he does it well at all. <laughs> it, it makes me cringe. Do you know? And I love Simon and Garfunkel. I must admit, it's a guilty pleasure, if you want to call it that. I've got a box set with all their albums and various things, and I do dig it out on occasion. And I can spend a whole evening with Simon and Garfunkel. Don't tell them that, though. Um, and uh, I put it on thinking, you know, he's got, he's got the voice and he's got the character. Doesn't work. Yeah, th th those yeah. things don't always work, unfortunately. I'll tell you, to be fair, as they say, other opinions are available. And lots and lots of people have said what a great version he's done, and it's very respectful. I personally wish that he just hadn't done it. But there you go, you don't know until you try. But there you go. So it's a bit up and down, but considering I didn't know what it was going to be, it kind of did what I thought it was going to do, and also what I didn't think it was going to do. So that's what a solo album should do. I think when you're in a band as established as Saxon, where you know what you're going to get, that if you're going to do a solo album, you still want to be able to like it for who it is. So you need that connection. I don't think, I mean, if it was free-form jazz, there's nothing wrong with free-form jazz, right. but not from Biff Byford, you know? So it, it has that connection, but he dares to be different, and that, to me, makes it a worthwhile effort. There's a lot of personal lyrics on it, too. I mean, there's songs talking about his childhood and, and his journey, and how lucky he is still to be doing what he's doing. And, and oh, I mean yeah, that yeah. as a compliment to him, because, you know, he's, he's an absolute legend of the genre. So this is a great, al a great album. Mm, no, it's a good album, is what this is. Any Saxon fan will find lots to like here, and maybe one or two things not to like quite so much. Okay. Very interesting, though. Sounds like something we call a pleasant surprise. Yes, absolutely. you go in with not many expectations, right? But I, you know, yeah. that's not surprising because you know, he's just been such a great singer for so long. I mean, he really is. He still sounds very, very good. I just saw them opening up for Judas Priest, what, a, a year ago? A little over well, a year ago, bell. something like that? Yeah, so, oh. and he, they, or maybe a year and a half ago, something like that. Uh, it was, on, I mean, this Judas Priest tour was like so long. I saw them three times on the tour, but uh, they were great. <laughs> they were great. And I saw them probably 10 years before that. And then the first time I ever saw Saxon was in 1982. Their second right. trip ever here to the U.S. opening up for Triumph. That's the, the oh, second, wow, yeah. second or third concert I ever saw. So a long time ago. And he's he's just great. He's great. Yeah. So, very cool. Yeah, he, still brings it, he still brings it. Absolutely. Very good. So from someone long established to someone that most people probably haven't heard of, I certainly hadn't, although it's not their first album. This is, uh, well, and the same again, 
I am making life hard for myself here because there's all sorts of things to see here. And whether this is called Polis or Polis, I'm not 100% certain. This is a band that are from East Germany. I know we don't have East and West Germany now. However, the East Germany side is important to them because they still feel that if you are from, there we are, absolutely, that if you're from the kind of East Germany side of that split, you'll get less opportunities. Now, I must admit that I've, I've reviewed this on Sea of Tranquility, okay? And what you've got here is you can see some vintage studio equipment. Now, the picture is blurry. That's not just my camera. The picture is blurry and it's trying to paint a picture. So you've got vintage analog equipment and everything here. And they actually spent a good few years going out there and finding old equipment to make a vintage sound. And I must admit that when I reviewed this on Sea of Tranquility, the website, I kind of misunderstood. Now, in here you'll find that there's quite a lot of writing. Mm -hmm. So you've got some in German, you've got some in English. I, well, they're both. It's a translation is what's there. And I got, uh, and I've written his name down, and I can't find it in there. But the singer, okay, um, Christian Rocha, emailed me after I'd done the review because what I said was, and I'll paraphrase, the booklet talks about trying to move people on from their kind of tight genre. Now I'm picking up a, a CD, so I thought, well, it's music. They're talking about, you know, prog. They're trying to do something different. And it does something different, but it doesn't do something different. Do you know, th there's nothing there that you think, well, it's air shatteringly original that, that it's never been done before. And I kind of thought, you know, it's a little bit of a highfalutin sort of idea. How, how are you going to move a genre on with one album? But they're talking about the human condition. Okay, Christian was kind enough to email me and say, you know, I'd like to review, thank you very much. However, never realised that people would maybe pick that up like this, but this is what I actually meant. So it's a talking about the human condition, talking about trying to knock us maybe out of some of the slumber that we're in, trying to move us on. So that it's a little bit more thought-provoking than that. And that sums the music up too. There's a lot of thought-provoking stuff in here. There are some great traditional kind of prog moments on it. I think early on in the album, you've got, here we go, Tropfen, Gedanken, and Leben. I apologize to anyone who is German. <laughs> there. Okay. I know that they're doing that right now. <laughs> and these are big set plays, you know, there's kind of moogs and things like that. And there's lots of swirling atmosphere. And it's done really well. And, and Christian himself is a good singer. He's not a pure singer. He's not going to give you, you know, a falsetto voice and, and, and pierce things with, with, with that clarity. But he brings an attitude and he, he brings a, a feel that I really think works with what they're doing. But then there's also stuff on here like Mantra, which closes it out. And it closes the album out with a, a massive swirl of tribal drumming. And there's an atmosphere built, and, and you can feel like they're trying to do something different, I have to say. There, there are moments that you don't expect mixed in with enough of what you do expect to, to give you something to hook into straight away. By hook into, I mean, you're not necessarily going to sing along. It's all sung in German as well, which I don't mind. I actually quite like to hear a band sing in their own language. I do like a chorus. I like to sing along. But there's an honesty, I think, sometimes in, in, in a band singing in something that they believe in, in the language that they're more comfortable in. And, Christian did admit that they actually struggled to get somebody to interpret what they've translated it in the booklet. They, they, they spoke to someone who helped them and what they got back, they actually kind of retranslated again. So mm. that was unfortunate more than anything else. But this is a real, it's a curio more than anything else because there's lots, so many bands out there, as you and I both know, and, and so does everyone else that's watching too, that don't get any, you know, real push and they just kind of bumble along doing phenomenal music. Oh, this is really good. So if you're looking to take a chance on something, I think that this, for, for someone who likes a lot of traditional prog that's trying to do something a little bit different, I would, I would suggest Polis. And the album is called Weltklang, or Weltklang, excuse me again, excuse my pronunciation. It, it, it's a great name. Probably a better name if you say it properly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing that because I have it. They, they sent a couple copies and I have one here okay. that I was going to eventually do a round table. I just haven't gotten to yeah. it yet uh, to your review. But now I really want to hear it because that sounds pretty intriguing. So I, I, think I love the cover because it's kind of it almost has this like Pink Floyd live like Pompeii uh, type yeah. of feel to it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, I did wonder if they were all naked on it. Thankfully, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's it's got that kind of feel. Um, and as I say, the cover says a lot about it. There's, there's big ideas on here. Yeah. As with most of them, they've got big ideas. Do they all come off? I'm not sure they do. But I admire that ambition to do it. It's not. It's close enough to make me want to do it. It's on uh, progressive promotions. Who do lots yeah. of this stuff? Yeah, they we cover a lot people. of their their artists. Yeah, yeah very um, good label. They're kind of the same. Quite a lot of the stuff that that, that that they'd put out, and it's always quite. I'm always there's a smile on my face when it comes through because I know pretty much nine times out of ten it's going to be something worthwhile that, that I'm going to be listening to. Yep, exactly. So from there, we go to Joe Satriani. Okay, so we go from same again. Never heard of them. To well, might have heard of them, but definitely heard of Joe Satriani. So his new album is called Shapeshifting. Okay. I'm, I'm a Satch fan. Do you know, I'm, I mean, I, I can't tell you everything about the guy and, I, and, I, and I'm never going to be, you know, the most knowledgeable, but man, is his music fantastic. The consistency, and he doesn't just do the same things. I think Shapeshifting maybe nods more to the past than some of his recent stuff. There are songs on Shapeshifting that to me, they go to the classic such, maybe not surfing, but flying in a blue dream, the extremist, there's there's a kind of feel and a production and a sound there that, that, that took me back there. All for love, uh, waiting, big distortion, far enough, uh, spirits, ghosts, um, and outlaws, they took me back to that kind of era when I got into Satriani. I, I actually was late. I didn't get surfed with the alien until after flying in a blue dream. Um, but they kind of took me back there. But then you've got things like Ali Farka, Dick Dale, and Alien and Me, which does sound <laughs> like a Frank Zappa song, but it's not. And it's kind of got a soft rock feel. I mean, now Satch has done, he's done jazz, and he's done a bit of reggae, and he's dabbled in various different things over the years, and he does them all very well, and they still sound like him. So there's a bit of soft, soft rock there, and there's a bit of reggae there too. There's Hear the Blue River. Now, reggae and me don't always get on, I have to say, but there's still enough of that feel that, that, that Satriani brings that I can live with it. It's never going to be my favourite song of his, but as soon as I hear that, kind of, eh, I'm in trouble. Do you know what? <laughs> I'm in trouble. And, you know, and, and apologies to anyone who loves reggae out there, but I'm going to sound like someone's dad here. It all sounds the same to me. So, yeah. And, yeah. Do you know... I don't know what we just did there, but it wasn't good. Okay. It wasn't, but that's okay. <laughs> a little bit of comic relief in the middle of everything, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I think one of the interesting things was because he's obviously got links with Eddie Van Halen in the past. There's 1980 on there. And that is, that's an, it's an, it's a homage to, to Eddie Van Halen, which is interesting for a guy like Satch that's got links with, with Van Halen from, from long, or Eddie Van Halen from long, long time ago. And he really does, it's not just, you know, ripping it up and down the fretboard and going wild, but it's got that feel. And he's, he's not apologetic about it. He yeah. says that that's exactly what he's trying to do. And, and I admire that because he's got the ability to do it really well. Interestingly, there's quite a lot of synth on the album. Do you know, and, and Satch has always kind of done that, but it's become more prevalent in recent times. And he does all that himself. And he admits he's not the best, best synth player. That's not easy to say. But I like the atmosphere that he creates. And there's lots of hand claps on the album. There's three or four songs where the snare is there somewhere, but it's buried deep underneath all of this. <laughs> and it kind of brings an 80s feel, almost an 80s kind of new romantic feel, dare I say. It's a bit of Adam and the Ants kind of giving it all this in the background. <laughs> I really like it. It's a bit... It's different. It's well-named. It's definitely a shape-shifting album. It's got different moods and different vibes. It's up and down, but it's Satriani, isn't it? You know you're going. To, you're in safe hands. You know it's going to be good. Yeah, I I kind of felt the same way. I I enjoy. You know, there's not any Satriani album that's not enjoyable to an extent. Right? Absolutely. He's got. I think for me, you know, I've been listening to him since he first came out with uh, you know, Not of This Earth and Surf with yeah. the Alien. I, I've been listening to him from the beginning, and. You know, that was a perfect time for all instrumental guitar music. And I think that for me personally, and I dabble in guitar too, I just, I think for me, I got a little fatigued with all instrumental guitar albums, probably like 
at the beginning of the 2000s because I'd listened mm-hmm. to so much of that kind of stuff. There was, there was so much of it around. There was, you know, and, this, yeah. and, um, and for me, I think I love his style. I think he's got a very lyrical sound yeah. and style and, and, and the way yeah. he writes his songs. Um, and I enjoyed this album and I've enjoyed almost everything he's put out. I don't think any of his albums have really, really, really grabbed me since like the extremist the flying in a blue dream and yeah. those couple like early mid nineties albums, they're all really good. And maybe there's just too many of them because I, I, for me, too many instrumental albums, guitar albums. I love instrumental albums. Like I'm a big fusion fan and I like, but I don't know what it is. It's like, I have enjoyed all the Saturani albums that have come out in recent years. I haven't loved any of them. Yeah, and, and I, do, I don't know I what it is. That. I mean, it's interesting you're saying that he's quite lyrical with, with what he plays. I mean, I've seen him live two or three times, maybe three or four times, and he mouths out every solo. That's yeah. I, you oh, can yeah. see him. You can see him sing the song, do you know? Well, that's what it is. He's writing songs without lyrics. Instead, yes. his guitar solos are the vocal lines. That's And yeah. that's that's very cool because not everybody does that. What did you think of Chicken Foot then? So did that kind of tick that box for you? Because I love chicken. I love chicken I food. Do. See, I... I would rather hear him in that uh, today, okay, in 2020. Me, I would rather hear Joe Satriani in a full band project. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah, have said I mean, that. I wouldn't have said that in 1990, though. No. But in 1990, I, I was totally digging that, that stuff. He, he, was bla- he was blazing a trail then. Yeah. And that's the thing. And I suppose the challenge has been, and he has done different albums. I mean, I think it's a self-titled album that is mellow and kind of jazzy and probably one I connect the least to be honest with you but at least he's kind of recognized that you can't do the same album over and over and over and I'm not saying that's what he was doing before because we'll be people up in arms about that suggestion because they're all different they all have a kind of theme which I quite like as well but yeah there's part of me that, that looks at chicken foot and does wonder if they could have had not Chad Smith on drums but he's such a big part of what they do but someone who was just had more time I th- yeah. think that they would have kind of probably gone on and done more. Um, and I probably would have liked more, to be honest, over and above. And I, I like shapeshifting. It's really good. And I've got all the Satriani's albums and I enjoy them all. So I'm not talking them down now after telling everyone it's a great album. Yeah. Yeah. I get, I get where you're coming from. I felt bad because I, you know, I reviewed almost everything he's done uh, in recent years. And I'm like, and I kind of almost say the same thing every, every review. It's like, I, I enjoy it. It's great for what it is. It's, the guitar playing's great. The songs are catchy, and I'm like, mm, it's just not what I want to hear from him anymore. I guess I don't know. I don't know what it is, and it, and it's it's hard when you're like you're enjoying something, but you want to enjoy the artist in a different way. I guess. Uh, I, I, anyway, I actually <laughs> wonder. And the, the crazy thing is, because he, uh, I mean, he, he's a phenomenal guitarist. Is the synth thing? Should he maybe be focusing on that more? Do you think then? I mean, who am I to tell him what to do? But. I don't know. That to me, I love those little atmospheric asides that he has on certain albums, you know, one or two minute long songs. The the guitar's just, it's part of the mood. It's not leading from the front, which is quite daring for a guitar album to do. And I must admit, he does them beautifully and they captivate me. And sometimes I wonder, do I want him to almost go the full jar on me? Do you know what I mean? Do I want him to, to go and do an oxygen? I don't know. The answer's probably no, because I'm sure if he did, I would go, what's he doing? Why is he on guitar on it? So he can't win. But no, yeah, you can't. You I, can. I, I get where you're coming from. Absolutely. I think we'd agree he's an amazing talent, no matter what he does. Yes. It's just, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. No, no, Sometimes happen. we take these guys for granted. I mean, he's been a part of well, the, our musical lives for so long. It's like, I know we're, he's always under the microscope. That's just the way it's going to be. But I, I don't know. I love the Chicken Foot Band, and I would like to hear more from them. But then, you know, would he slot right into Sammy's current band? I mean, probably, because well, I think Jason thing. Bonham yeah. would be a perfect, you know, just yeah. bring Jason Bonham into Chicken Foot. And just, I mean, yeah. Wouldn't that work? Yeah, that's, that's, an, that's an interesting question. I mean, of course, and I mean, he, he deputized in Deep Purple for a tour. And I mean, I've got a bootleg of that. And man, oh, man, he... he, he he just he just sits where he's meant to sit, and and yeah, okay, they make a big deal at the fact that they've got Joe Satriani in there. They've got a guy who's, you know, in a different way as good as Blackmore standing there. But he doesn't come out and go, "Well, I'm Joe Satriani, so here we go. I'm going to do all." It's none right. of that, you right. know. So he can't. I, th- I think he could slot into absolutely anything. But what I, I mean, 
we're, we're kind of giving them a hard time here. I'm coming on here to tell you what a great album is. We're kind of giving them a hard time here. <laughs> I know, right? We're digressing. We're going, we're going down yeah. that rabbit hole, right? I know. So, yeah. they're, they're no, we, we love Joe the... Satriani, everybody. Yeah. This is not a well, knock on Joe Satriani. We're, we're overanalyzing it too much. Well, the so. biggest compliment I can give him is that if you look back, for me, there's guys like Vinnie Moore. He's a great instrumental guitarist. He's known for being UFO's guitarist. His instrumental albums are kind of, you know them or you don't. Satriani's a name. And he was a name prior to Chicken Foot, and he was a name prior to being in Deep Purple for five minutes. And he's still a name for being a, a, an instrumental guitarist. And how yeah. many of those in the rock world can you honestly say have managed to do that across, whether it be 17, 18 albums now? And people still. 30 want years, to to yeah, 30 plus years, and, yeah. yeah. And still want to go see him live. So, yep. yeah, we've given him a little bit of a hard time. I'm blaming you for that. I came on here to talk. Okay, I'll, I'll take, I'll take full responsibility. I'm all to you. Even though I agree with you, I'm going to. I should have kept my mouth shut. See, I decided to, yeah, I, you, you did know, a fine review, and then I went down to the right way. Here's what I got to say. Do you know what the thing is? It's honest, isn't it? Do you know what? I, I put it on, and it's a great album. It is. It's, it's I, enjoyable. I it, yeah. I, and I suppose listening to, to your take there, the question I now have to ask myself is if I'm going to go and pick up a Joe Satriani album, will I pick that up and listen to it? And I'd say most times no. And that doesn't diminish the fact that I think it's a really good album. But Hutton, has he peaked? Yeah. I believe it now. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of my point. It's a great album. It's just not a great album for me anymore. Yeah. You know, it's, it's good. I listened to it a few times, enjoyed it. Mm, well, you well, I go back it. to it. So there you go. That's I don't know. It's it great for what it is. I just, I would rather hear Satriani doing other stuff right now. But that's that, that's yeah. not taken away from how good the album is. So anyway, no, I, no, <laughs> interesting discussion. I like it. This could have been a whole show about it Joe Satriani at this rate, right? Absolutely, it could have been almost nearly. There you go. So we've done some prog. We've done some proper traditional metal. We've done some, you know. East German prog, we don't talk about that very often, and we've done a guitar instrumental album, so I thought we'll do something else different. And this is a band called Dante Fox. Now, let's not confuse Dante Fox for the British prog Dante Fox, because this is really Great White. So, okay, so this is the roots of Great White, 1978 to 1982. So you've got Jack Russell on here, and you've got Mark Kendall on here, and you've got the guys who are on the first uh, EP and album and various things like that, playing bass and drums. You've also got a couple of guys who were in the band prior to that. So there's a couple of songs on here as well that actually went on to feature later on. You've got In Love, which became On Your Knees. Okay, so that was from the debut EP. Um, the fact it was called On Your Knees tells you all about the lyrics, shall we say. And then you've also got Money, which became Stick It. And that was on, depending on which territory you're in, either the Stick It album or the Great White album. I've got the Great White album because that's where it came out. Yeah, I, don't, I don't remember what it was on here, but that was a pretty notable song for them at the time. Yeah, absolutely. So that, there's only those two that, that kind of morphed into something different. Uh, I was certainly say in love. I mean, you can sing on your knees, down on your knees, over, over the song that's here. I mean, it's sanctioned. There are very short liner notes from Jack Russell in here. I mean very short line of notes in here so you you know that it's well when i say sanctioned let's just say that jack and mark don't get on anymore okay? no they don't yeah it's no, been a long time really, yeah really don't and, and the very <clears> fact <throat> that we've got stuff like this coming out and jack russell is obviously backing this because he's done the line of notes and he's just released which i haven't heard yet but i want to hear I'm not sure i want to hear but i want to hear he's doing an acoustic one which is you know classic great white with jack russell's great white not sure I think I think I have that here for you. Oh, right. yeah. thank you. I do want to hear it. So there you <laughs> go. Um, I, I was lucky enough to receive in the pack I got from you. There's a live album in there as well. So there's a lot of activity around this catalogue just now. This is interesting. I think if you're a great white fan, then I think you probably need to have this. If you like the early stuff, um, I, I'm not talking the classic stuff. I'm not talking quite face to day. I'm not talking quite once bitten into Twice Shy. I actually think Twice Shy is kind of doing that by that stage, although it's the one that was huge for them. I actually yeah. think they were a better band. Slightly prior to that, you got much more of the blues about them at that stage, much more of the Zeppelin that if you've got any of the live stuff, well, I mean, they covered whole nights of Led Zeppelin and it's obvious. And Jack Russell doesn't necessarily get the credit that he deserved at this stage and a little bit beyond for being a great vocalist. He did kind of lose that too. Sorry, Jack. But 
uh, this, this is interesting. The, the issues are with a lot of stuff that's coming out now. There's a lot of it's demo quality, okay? And there's some stuff that's kind of, you know, live broadcast. There's one that's even got, I don't know if it's real from the time or if it was an idea that they had, but it's got a, a radio intro on it. And I think it is just like a, a, a live thing from a radio show, which gives it a bit of atmosphere and, and it's good fun. But it's interesting that you can hear what the, what the band were about to do here, do you know? And I mean, having songs like On Your Knees was never going to help. They're not a hair metal band. I don't like that phrase, by the way. I like party rock, or whatever you want to call it. You know, okay, my hair's never been much longer than this, so I've <laughs> never been a hair metal guy, right? But they're one of the bands, and people are not going to like me here, we're going to get lots of beavers and butthead underneath this one, like Winger, who people deride because they came out at a certain time. But you listen to the music, you listen to the playing. I mean, Mark Kendall's a great guitarist, do you know? And, and he's ripping out some really good solos here, but the, but the songs right, the songwriting's good, especially for a band that are shopping for a deal at this stage. These are demos that got them deals and got them noticed. And I didn't really expect to hear much of this stuff on an, an official release, and it's hard to know what's official and what it's not these days. But it's clear yeah. that it. so it's a proper label that are, that are out there doing it. And and as I say, I would like to have read much more. And, and Jack Russell alludes to what's kind of come in the liner notes, but there's just a couple of words about how great the times were back then, and at least he is saying how great the times were back then, but there's stuff like Need Your Love, which is bizarrely is almost new wave of British heavy metal. You would never have thought that from, from this sort of band. Yeah. Um, that, that was a bit of a shock to me, but it's actually really good. It's one of the highlights on, on it to me. Not that I would ever have expected it, but I just think that there's lots of stuff out there just now. There's lots of radio broadcasts, and it's hard to know what to choose and what not to, because an awful lot of it is not very good, to be honest with you. There's some of it that really, I think the artists themselves probably wouldn't want out there. And if you go into some of the sites that are selling lots and lots and lots of CDs, you put in an, an artist's name these days and you just get this massive list of stuff that you think, what is this? What is that? Kiss is a great example. You go in and you put Kiss into whatever site you use to buy your CDs and you'll have a list of about 20 radio shows. Now, some of them are great. Some of them are not um, great. <laughs> no. But if you're a great white fan, I would say that this, and this is the final one that, that I'm covering here, this is well worth your time. And I'm not suggesting it's going to replace the albums that you love and, and that you've listened to for, for years and years, but I do think that it's got a place and it certainly sets up what, what's going to come. Um, and it's one of those CDs that, that, that's come out from that sort of genre of going back and finding things from the past that does have a value to it and, and is, is worth a listen. Cool. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, you can see Stephen's full reviews on the website at www.seatranquility.org. Uh, we can get, he gets more in depth in all the individual songs and what have you. So uh, good stuff there. We got quite, so you got to, to look forward to, you got Biff Bifer, you got Dante Fox, you got um, Burning Witches, Pure Reason Revolution, M Opus, Paulus and Joe Satriani. So That's all it. sorts of good new releases to check out. And uh, Stephen, thanks again for running through all these for us. Oh, we greatly pleasure. appreciate it. Well, Stephen will be back uh, over the next couple of weeks. We'll be doing this again, talking about some more great new releases that you guys should be aware of. And uh, like I said, this is on the web at www.seatranquilly.org. Check us out on Facebook. Check us out on Twitter. And we're here all the damn time on YouTube, right? So uh, I am Pete Pardo for Stephen Reed. Thanks for watching. We appreciate everybody. Have a good one and we'll see you real soon. Take care. Bye-bye.